All right. Hello, everyone. I'm calling the meeting tonight. Um, it's 6.02 p.m. Um, and it's Wednesday, February 23rd. Um, this is the Equal Rights Commission um, public hearing in regards to housing. Um, before we can begin, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending tonight and um, for the city staff, the commissioners, and um, anyone else who helped coordinate this um, public hearing. Um, so I want to take roll call before we begin. And so um, if you are here present, please say aye. Please unmute yourself and say aye or here. Um, Commissioner John Shelton. Here. Commissioner Christina Ortiz. Here. Commissioner Elder Corpus Dex. Here. And then um, I believe, uh, or sorry, Commissioner Michael Vinson. Here. Okay, and then I believe um, Commissioner Marcus Grignan is gonna join us a little bit later on, um, but the ones that are absent tonight are Isaac Kavashinsky um, and Elizabeth Kashka, and then Saeed Hassan will join us a little bit later on tonight as well. Point of oh. order, I see that Marcus is here. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Okay, um, let's see. All right, um, Marcus, we're taking roll call right now. So um, please um, unmute yourself and say aye if you're here. Hey, everybody. Also, good evening. I am here. This is Marcus Greeno, Commissioner for the Equal Rights Commission. Hi, welcome, Marcus. All right. Um, thank you, John, for that. Okay, so um, moving on, um, we do have quorum tonight. So um, we can go ahead and get approval of the agenda and the minutes tonight. So can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Ortiz, is there a second? Second. Okay, second by um, Alder Corpus Dex. Okay, so the approval of the agenda um, moves forward and then um, a motion to approve of the minutes. So moved. Moved by Alder Corpus Dax. I second. Okay. Second by um, Commissioner Ortiz. All right. Um, okay. So moving on to agenda item E, which is just the regular business. Um, and um, tonight, our Equal Rights Commission is hosting our first public hearing in regards to housing. Um, the Equal Rights Commission was created in order to uh, engage with the public and in, enforce um, the enforcement of the Equal Rights Commission or Equal Rights Ordinance that was created by Mayor Eric Gunrick. And we, what we hope to accomplish is to make sure that all of the res residents here in the city of Green Bay um, has all of the needs met. And one of the biggest priorities right now is housing. Um, a, a great um, a way to paraphrase that, and this is coming from Commissioner John Shelton. Um, he shared a, a great passage with me that he wrote, and I wanna read that out real quick to everyone. Um, the ERC is charged with exploring the state of equal rights of equal rights in the city of Green Bay. As Americans, we believe there are certain things we all need to live as fellow citizens and to have equal opportunity. Among these rights are jobs, housing, education, childcare, transportation, and healthcare. We've chosen to begin examining housing in Green Bay since it has been identified as a critical issue to our city, in our city, by a number of stakeholders, including a majority a major city rede redevelopment author authority report in 2020. We seek to, to determine how race, class, gender, sexuality, disability status, and economic means are leading, to, are leading to unequal access to housing and to recommend suggestions for ins ensuring everyone has equal access in the future. Um, and so with that being said, um, I'd like to also invite Commissioner John Shelton to share a little bit more um, of his perspective in this. And then um, I'd like to introduce all of the commissioners because we have not officially done that um, uh, to the public just yet. So um, yes, yeah, Commissioner um, Shelton, would you like to share any other words? That was a beautiful um, paraphrase of what the Equal Rights Commission was. 
Thank you, Commissioner Yang. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, one of the things that we've done, this is our first ever Equal Rights Commission, um, you know, in, in Green Bay. And so one of the things we've done as the commission is try to think uh, in big and creative ways about what we can do to make our city more equal. And so, you know, there's there's been a, a series of, of you know, regional and local reports about the real struggles people in our community are facing connected to housing. So as a commission, we've decided to start looking into this and we're not looking to reinvent any of the really good work that's been done, but to specifically think about all of that work from an equal rights lens, right? There's lots of other lenses you could look at this work, right? Like, you know, um, access to housing is important for employers and that's you know really really great and important and something we should be thinking about it's really important for in terms of the built environment it's it's important in terms of tax re revenue thing is looking at this from stri strictly from the terms of equal rights and i don't think there's there's been a lot of this work that's taken that as its primary perspective so that's what we're doing here we want to build on that work we want to hear we're so thankful to have uh, some guests here today who are doing some of this work who can kind of tell us about it and help us understand what's going on. Um, because we want to we want to really sort of amplify the work that's being done and you know crystallize it and think about what we can be doing as a commission to support that and work so that's I think where we're coming from and uh, we're, we're really thrilled to have everybody here tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Shelton. Um, so um, that gives you a little bit of the context of what the Equal Rights Commission is and um, why we're hosting this public hearing tonight um, in regards to housing. Um, I also wanted to give um, all the commissioners a chance to introduce themselves um, and share um, why they are part of this commission. Um, and so, um, I guess I can go first. Um, so my name is Terry Yang. My family and I have been business owners here for the past 16 years. And um, the reason why I'm so passionate about um, this Equal Rights Commission and making sure that we had that ordinance in place for the city was because I was born and raised here. And um, the particularly the um, for, for me, um, how I relate to it is that the Asian American population here just hasn't been represented, represented um, at key decision-making tables. And so that's kind of what I'd like to see a little bit more of. Um, so that's why I'm here. Um, please, commissioners, just unmute yourself and go ahead and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am Michael Vinson. I live on the east side of Gray, Green Bay with my husband and two little kids. Professionally, I work at Charber Foods where I'm a sales director. Uh, and so I do bring that kind of corporate downtown lens to, to this conversation. Uh, within Schreiber, I've, I've been a part of several of our, what we call business resource groups focused on several dimensions of, of identity and difference. Uh, and outside of work, I've, I've served on the board, board chair of Fair Wisconsin, our state's LGBTQ LG, uh, civil rights organization. Uh, and so I, I bring some of those lenses uh, as well. Hi, I'm um, Alder Corpus Dax. Um, I've been on city council um, almost four years. I'm nearing the end of my term. Um, I was also born and raised in Green Bay. So I've seen a lot of change over the last uh, 43 years years 44 going on 44 um to the makeup of this city and i think it's really important that um you know part of why i wanted uh, to see this come to fruition is that it's important that the diversity that this city is experiencing is um sorry if you can hear my dog in the background she's going nuts <laughs> playing with her toy um but I, I just thought it was really important that the city had an equal rights commission where um, we could be dealing with some of the issues that uh, some of the other um, minority communities are experiencing um, in, within the city itself, because I don't know that the city ever really uh, took it upon themselves when they started to experience this big influx of diversity if they ever really, you know, addressed it um, citywide. So that's why I think it's important that we have this, this uh, commission. I guess I, <clears throat> I can go next. Uh, my name is Christine Ortiz. I work at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. 
I'm a uh, faculty there and um, I'm part of, I, I didn't grow up in Green Bay, but I've been living here uh, for 30 years now. So I have also witnessed the changes that uh, Commissioner Corpus uh, was referring to. And uh, I think that the way I see my role in, in this um, commission is to, to ensure that the, the richness of the diversity of the people that are uh, calling Green Bay their home uh, is represented, is represented in our political institutions, in, in, in our government. Uh, so my primary interest is education, bilingualism, cultural preservation. Um, so <clears throat> I work in the community with different groups that um, focus on, on those aspects, but you know, I, and primarily in the Spanish speaking uh, population that lives in Green Bay. Uh, I can I can go ahead and go, and then I think the only person we're missing is Marcus, so maybe he could go next. Uh, like uh, Commissioner Ortiz, I am a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Um, my I'm a historian, and so uh, a lot of my uh, historical research looks at issues of inequality. Well, Americans have or and others have organized to to overcome. Uh, various inequitable systems and, and make um, societies more democratic. Um, and also come from, uh, from uh, the lens of labor. I'm a I'm vice president for the American Federation of Teachers, Wisconsin. Um, so that's sort of another this in terms of workplace democracy, good jobs. Um, and then I also serve on the board of, of Kamza, which uh, Saeed will be here in a little bit. He's the executive director. Uh, which is a Somali, um, or started by Somalis, but it's refugee and immigrant uh, advocacy network. Uh, we're doing work with um, uh, Afghan refugees uh, in the, now, and much credit to Saeed as far as that goes. Um, and by the way, it's Give Big Green Bay. So uh, if you have a couple bucks to kick into Kamza, that would be much appreciated. Um, but uh, yeah, so those are kind of all the different angles I'm, I'm, you know, coming with, and I'm just really excited that that this exists. And I mean, you, you know, all of the great people who are involved in this so far. I think that's and how many great people there are. Um, but just really excited to to be part of this. Also, uh, Maniwiak, Nakato Manowich, Kiki Tim, Kispi So, McCake, Anit Akayan. Mishik Nawiswan, Marcus Crino. Um, hello, everyone. My people know me as Kispiso McCake or Swift Otter and was named Marcus Crino by my parents. I'm an enrolled member of the Menami Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, and uh, I was born and raised in Green Bay. Um, I traveled a lot, uh, did some work uh, with the AmeriCorps, worked on Capitol Hill. Um, and really, I think when I left Green Bay, was really what I was doing is just like taking a journey of seeing what else is out there in the world and what I could bring home and share with my community. So um, it's, it's a real honor to serve on the commission just because um, I think the indigenous perspective for a long time, probably pre Standing Rock was invisible. And uh, it warms my heart to know that more indigenous people are taking positions. And for that matter, more, you know, people of color who are in position. So when I was asked to serve on the commission, I, I was very honored to, and I, I accepted it. Um, I wish y'all could see me right now, but my, my, I have a, I have a PC computer that doesn't allow me to use my camera. I have a Mac, but I, those Macs, they, they basically built them to break. Uh, it's sad, but, um, but that's, that's the reason why it's not like I'm, I'm nervous or like, I don't want to like show my face or anything, but that's the reason why. But um, that's who I am. I don't really have um, an angle. I guess my background is public policy, um, working in indigenous communities, creating economic development, and um, just a lot of community organizing. I've been an organizer for a number of years. And so that's kind of my perspective I'm kind of bringing in and to the table, both tonight and on the commission.
Thank you, commissioners. It's always just so refreshing to hear all the different and amazing person you have at this table. Um, so moving forward, um, it's about 6, 17 p.m. right now, and I know we have um, three presenters tonight. So um, I wanted to give John, uh, Commissioner John Shelton, um, a chance to go into more detail about um, the housing crisis that we are facing, and then we will move into our um, into the program. And our first um, speaker tonight is Beth Hudak from uh, the Executive Director of House of Hope. So, um, John, if you'd like to share a little more, um, otherwise we can move forward with this, the first speaker. Yeah, I mean, I'll keep this really short, just because you know I know we've got a lot of guests here tonight, but you know there, there's been several again, just like really. Um, uh, prominent reports that have come out in the past couple of years, past couple of years, including a very recent report on housing and homelessness, and you know it's 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 pretty staggering. Um, you know, just some of the things that we're hearing about the the lack of affordable options and the growth of homelessness over the last uh, you know decade or so um, in in Green Bay. It's been exacerbated by the by the pandemic. Um, you know, and and you know some of the. Some of the statistics again are, are are pretty staggering. I mean, the the recommendation is that um, for housing to be affordable, um, a renter or you know a mortgage should only be about thirty percent of somebody's um, you know income, and you know that for a six hundred dollar a month apartment, which is kind of at the bottom end of what's affordable here, that means somebody has to make you know thousand dollars a year, which means a minimum wage, working like with no vacation days, five days a week, uh, you know, something like $26,000, $27,000 a year, um, you know, and so uh, it's, it's, things are, I think, you know, housing is only getting less affordable. Um, and so this is something where all these sort of reports are pointing out that uh, people are struggling to find access to housing on sort of the bottom end of the income level. These, these, dis these are disparities that are very much connected to race um, both in terms of, uh, you know, African-American, some people identifying as African-American or native. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's what we wanted to hear from or from, or specifically from people who are working on this so that we can get, right. Those are, those are, those are numbers. Uh, but, you know, I think what we want to hear more is, is sort of, you know, how, how are groups struggling to, or, you know, working to make this better for people. And what can we do as a commission to support that and 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 you know get better at um, elevating that message here? So, um, you know, really curious to hear what people, what our guests are going to have to say. And um, you know, um, obviously, all the commissioners should 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 be thinking about what kinds of questions they have and how much we can learn from our guests tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Shelton. Um, yes, I want to echo what. Commissioner Shelton was saying um, at the end there where tonight is an educational night for us as commissioners and we want to um, understand and learn as much as we can um, in regards to housing and the housing crisis. And so I also want to say um, that this is a safe and open space. Um, please, um, uh, as for the presenters, um, please feel free to um, speak um, what do you have on your mind? Um, don't feel afraid to bring up some of the top, tough topics that there are in housing. And then um, a few housekeeping items. Um, commissioners, if you have questions, we ask that you wait until the end of the presenter um, presenters um, session um, so that, um, so that um, we can move things along. Um, and then if there are any technical difficulties um, for the presenters along the way, um, please, um, you all have my direct line or right in the chat. Um, contact one of us and we will be um, we will be able to help you guys. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd love to um, introduce you guys Beth Hudak. Um, she's the executive director for, for the House of Hope. Um, thank you. So I'm actually the director of community engagement for House of Hope. Oh, gosh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so my name is Beth Hudak. I have been... Um, doing community engagement with House of Hope for the last six years. Um, currently, I'm the chair of the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition. I am a commissioner on the Brown County Planning Commission. Um, I sit on the legislative committee for the League of Women Voters of the state of Wisconsin to advise on youth and homeless issues, as well as housing. Um, and I sit on the board of the Adolescent Parenting Coalition. 
So um, House of Hope primarily is an emergency shelter. We do some uh, additional housing as well. Our focus is on youth and young families. We've been around since 2000 um, and then started our housing stability programming where we provide up to 24 months of rental assistance to low income youth and families in 2013. Um, and in 2020, we opened the Hope Center, which is a licensed shelter care facility. It is the only licensed shelter care facility in the state of Wisconsin that is licensed zero to 17, so that we don't have to separate uh, minors from their children if they're parenting and experiencing homelessness. Um, so that's a little bit about me and House of Hope. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna kind of touch on with all of you is going to be really intersectional. Um, we can't just talk about housing and not talk about all of the other things, right? A lot of my work is focused on youth. So a lot of that will also be a part of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but I also do wanna point out um, the other two women who are here to speak, absolutely amazing. But I do want us to acknowledge that we are all white women who are middle-class, who are speaking on these issues. And that really points to a lack of diversity in housing services. And we are aware of it, um, but that is also something that hopefully this commission could assist with. Um, you know, all of our organizations have individuals with lived experience on our boards, um, but not many of us have uh, individuals of uh, color and minorities on our executive level teams. Um, and that's just something that Obviously, a systemic, it points to, um, you know, uh, systemic issues in the education system, systemic issues in the judicial system, systemic issues in policing and housing and all of those things that, you know, kind of culminate in there being lack of representation and leadership. Um, I think that's something that we also see uh, pretty much everywhere in um, northeastern Wisconsin, at least. Um, so, uh, all right. <laughs> Um, so what House of Hope does to help people in um, Green Bay, obviously we have the emergency shelter and some housing things. And we also are really focused on advocacy. Um, a big part of what we do is um, kind of figuring out what can we assist with um, legislatively and um, who can we advocate for and how can we make sure that our leaders are, uh, when they're making policies are thinking about people who don't look like them, people who don't experience the world like them, and um, people who are the most vulnerable with the softest or least heard voices uh, when they're passing laws. Um, we were really, really lucky that in 2019, we were able to assist with the passage of 2019 Wisconsin Act 22 that allows 17 year olds to access shelter. That's huge, it's fantastic. An entire wing of our adult shelter is focused on youth 17 to 24. Um, that wing of our shelter is for um, youth who either identify as female or are biologically female. So we do serve a significant number of trans 17 year olds because there really isn't any other place for them to be currently. Um, but one of the things that's really significant about this current law is that while 17 year olds can access shelter, we still have this uh, law in Wisconsin called the Defense of Infancy which prohibits anyone under the age of 18 from entering into any contract of any kind. Um, so while our minors can access shelter if they're experiencing homelessness, and there are a couple of things like reproductive health care, STD testing, and alcohol and drug addiction counseling that they can access in the state of Wisconsin and consent to, uh, regular health care they cannot consent to. So we could have a 17-year-old giving birth who cannot get an epidural because she cannot consent to one, but as soon as that baby is in the world, she has every legal right over making every medical decision for that infant. So these are some of the things when I talk about how it's like really intersectional, um, you can't separate them. And one of the things that we see is, um, and one of the trends that we're seeing right now is younger families that are larger. Um, in the last fiscal year, House of Hope served 515 children, and in the fiscal year prior to that, we served 100 less, but the same number of households. So uh, 
and we're still focusing on young families with children. So that's something that's trending. We probably need to be talking about, um, you know, can we get, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, better sex education in schools? Um, and when we're focusing on youth, there's some other things that we also should probably be talking about. You know, uh, Green Bay Area Public Schools became majority minority about five or six years ago. About 80 plus percent of Green Bay Public School students qualify for free and reduced lunch. And at the last available statistics, which would be the 2018-2019 school year from the Department of Public Instruction, one in 20 enrolled Green Bay Area Public School students experienced homelessness during that school year. Those are significant numbers, and this is a significant problem. And it's not just what we're seeing in St. John's Park because it's starting for children. Um, we're sorry, I get really a little passionate. Um, a little soapboxy too. Sorry about that. Um, there is a there is some um, other surveys that are other uh, research that I'd really encourage everyone to look at. Um, out of Chapin Hall in, at the University of Chicago, there is a uh, research to impact um, sort of uh, organization, I guess, um, called the Voices of Youth Count. And they have been doing some national estimates on youth homelessness. And uh, some of the things that they've found are really quite jarring. Um, and a lot of what it is, is that regardless of where you live in the US, rural, urban, or suburban, the percentages at which youth are experiencing homelessness is the same. So their national estimates um, are showing that youth between the ages of 18 and 25, in a 12 month period, one in 10 will experience homelessness. And for 13 to 17 year olds, one in 30 will experience homelessness without a parent or guardian. So we are talking about unaccompanied youth experiencing homelessness at extremely young ages, and we're expecting that not to affect their future. Um, some of the other things that are um, you know, pretty significant is talking about additional risk factors. So the number one risk factor for youth experiencing homelessness is a high school education. Young, um, young people who have not graduated from high school are 346% more likely to experience homelessness than their peers who have graduated from high school. Black and African-American youth are 83% more likely to experience homelessness and unmarried parenting youth are 200% more likely to experience homelessness than their non-parenting peers. Um, LGBTQ youth are also at a much higher risk of experiencing homelessness. It's around 120% more likely for uh, LGBTQ youth to experience homelessness than um, their like cisgendered uh, straight peers. So I threw a lot of numbers at you <laughs> and I'm gonna throw a couple more that are a little more personal. I think it is really important to understand um, like nationally what the estimates are saying. And what's so significant about that is when I tell you one in 30, 13 to 17 year olds are gonna experience homelessness in a 12 month period, I can also tell you one in every 20 enrolled Green Bay Public School students between kindergarten and, and 12th grade experienced homelessness in one school year. So the numbers that are being reported nationally, we are not escaping from them. Um, finally, I kind of wanna talk a little bit about racial demographics. From the 2020 census, we know that 80.2% of Brown County residents were white. Um, in that same year, House of Hope served 25% of our clients were, of, of who we served were white. Um, the remainder were um, all uh, minorities, primarily multiracial minorities. Um, I think that's super impactful and super important to understand just how significant and how um, much harder hit uh, minority populations are when it comes to homelessness and poverty. There are some root causes um, and a lot of them are, are linked to generational trauma, generational poverty. And now what we've been starting to see over the last maybe five years is generational homelessness. So we're seeing families like where the grandparents were the first generation to experience homelessness and we're now serving their grandchildren as adults. Um, as a community, um, as a nation, 
you know, we started seeing generational poverty maybe about 30 to 40 years ago. And so it's kind of incredible just how quickly generational homelessness caught up to where generational poverty um, was. And I think the last thing I'd really like to point out is um, I was told that you guys all got a copy of the blueprint. Um, I would really encourage you to spend some time um, starting on page 19. Um, there's a lot of information. It's pretty brief, um, but really quite alarming um, about the impact and history of homelessness, of, of racism on homelessness and how a lot of what we're looking at is legislative action that was done without thinking about those individuals who have most, the most vulnerabilities um, and who are the least seen and the least heard. And um, what we're seeing that did is create, you know, a system of um, minorities experiencing homelessness and poverty at much greater rates. So um, I think the last question you wanted me, if I had a magic wand, um, what would I wanna do? Uh, essentially, we need more housing inventory. Um, there's lots of funding that's available in the community for us to pay people um, rent, but there aren't a lot of um, options for acquiring properties um, that would be rental units. We can acquire shelters and things like that, but rental units are a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, while we would like to rely on things like uh, tax credits, Brown County doesn't have a large enough population to compete against populations like Milwaukee and Madison to get those tax credits, the low income housing tax credits. Um, and then I'd also really like HUD to raise their fair market rents so that we could actually find affordable rental units that we could pay for. Thank you for nodding, Erica, I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately, the amount of funding that we can use to pay someone's rent is more than $100 below the average rent, like for a two bedroom apartment. Um, and HUD bases what fair market rent in our community is on two to five year old census data. And they didn't take into account anything that happened during uh, COVID-19. So unfortunately, we're really in a sticky situation where we have hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for rent for low-income individuals and families, and we have no place for them to go. So thank you for your time. <laughs> we'll take any questions. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Yang, would you like us to just jump in or do you want us to raise our hands if we have questions? Um, no, I think um, it's a small enough group that we can just um, go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Um, so no need to raise your hand or anything. Um, I just would like to also enforce that this is more conversational and educational. So um, if you do have a pressing question, um, that we don't have time for tonight, feel free to email me and I'll connect you with the presenters. But um, no, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask away. So I, I just wanna say thank you for, for that. That I learned a lot from that in just whatever that was, like 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, 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 did, I did read the blueprints I've spent the past few days reading pretty much all of these reports, which has been really fun and, and illuminating. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I noticed, I, I noticed, I, I noted this when the when I read the blueprint is there's a section in there that talks about having a radical imagination. And as a historian, I was, you know, you you mentioned it, Beth. I, I was just, you know, really blown away at how good the historical description of how it is that we got to this moment. Um, you know, pretty detailed, uh, you know, um, explanation of things like redlining and, you know, these federal um, entities that are largely responsible for a lot of the racial segregation that, in, you know, marked much of the 20th century and then set up these sort of, you know, legacies that, that you noted. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I think we're really trying to do here is, you know, at least from my perspective, maybe all the commissioners don't agree, but like, I want to see this as a venue to like really push some of those bigger ideas. 
um, and, and maybe even radical ideas, because it's clear that the incremental stuff that we've been doing isn't working. I mean, you, you're sort of speaking to this. I was hoping that you could tell us sort of along those lines, you know, what, what is it, what is it like, you, you mentioned that you can um, assist young people for a certain period of time. What is the process like to transition them toward permanent housing? How, how successful are you with that? How, how does that, you know, and I'm not looking for specific numbers, but just in general, like, you, you know, what are some of the challenges that, um, you know, people face when they're, when they're trying to get permanent housing in, in Green Bay? Is it, is it just about, um, you know, like income, uh, income and having enough for rent? Is it, are there other impediments that, that you might want to, that we might want to be aware of? Um, yeah, I mean, like there are lots of <laughs> barriers to housing um, that are, you know, everything from age uh, to, um, you know, a lot of DV victims have multiple um, evictions on their records because of their abusers. Um, you know, so there are lots of, uh, lots of impediments. Um, I think currently, um, like I had mentioned, it's the housing stock uh, just not being there. Um, because, you know, I mean, like the federal government gave us kind of like carte blanche, we can give landlords five times one month's rent just to get somebody into an apartment. Um, but if there's six other people who make more money and might be less of, um, you know, less of like a risk because they're not on a program, you know, that's another thing that we pretty consistently see, um, transitioning out of one of like a rapid rehousing style program is actually relatively successful. Um, I would say community-wide, it's probably about 80% um, or more of uh, families and individuals who get into a rapid rehousing program and get housed transition either into no subsidy whatsoever or um, to something like an ICS Section 8 housing choice voucher that they can then keep with them in their unit indefinitely. Um, so the model of program is very successful. <laughs> we just need more places to put people. Um, you know, and I think uh, there's this real misunderstanding about what low income housing has to be. Um, you know, and, and I had mentioned the low income housing tax credits. You know, I think Green Bay area, Brown County area gets maybe like one deal for low, you know, like one, um, development deal for low-income housing tax credits maybe every three years. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but it's usually not very much. Um, and it certainly doesn't cover the cost of new development. Uh, there isn't a lot of money in not developing high-end, um, you know, ultra high-end luxury apartments um, because you can charge more for them. But at the same time, like if, if we, um, and I can, I'm not going to try to speak for you, Erica, but um, I could say that like with House of Hope's program and New Caps program, like our rapid rehousing program specifically, if we could get developers to just do 15% of their units as low income, they would never miss a rental payment for like the life of those just because of how much money we have that we could just consist, even if they needed to evict a client, we could like still pay the rent and put another person in right away. So like, <laughs> I think the barrier maybe is like the lack of housing, you know, and it's also these sort of things that like break down systems that we didn't think about when the system started, right? People are living longer. So there aren't houses for people to buy. So then people stay in rental units longer, which means, <laughs> you know, so it's this whole thing when, when any type of thing about our population changes, if the system doesn't change with it, then the system breaks. So that's really helpful. If I could just ask one quick follow-up question. So, so you're saying um, that one thing, one way to, to deal with this would be to have HUD raise the amount that you could, you know, you could pay for housing. Mm -hmm. Let's say hypothetically, in a crazy world where anything was possible, the city itself were to construct a bunch of like, you know, two thousand housing units in the next couple of years and subsidize the, you know, those, those rents so that they would be low enough so that the rest would be covered um, with the money that you have. Would that, would that solve the problem? I'm just asking. That, that oh, yeah. So um, the question would be, 
how is the city subsidizing them? Because if the city is subsidizing those units with any type of state or federal funding, then we can't use our program dollars there. Gotcha. Okay, that's helpful. <laughs> so if the city is just building low income and they're not subsidized, then we can put people in them. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of federal rules and like, um, you know, our community really showed up when we um, put out that like HUD was ready to, uh, they were um, taking comments on FMR and um, it was national. They were taking comments on FMR. Um, I believe that there were at the end of that, something like 65 comments and 64 of them were from residents of Brown County and Green Bay requesting that HUD raise the fair market rent and HUD didn't. That's frustrating. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been yeah. terrific. So not that like, like we should be thinking like big, but like, do you guys know anyone who works at HUD who we could like call? Like that might make it better. <laughs> Um, I don't have a personal contact at HUD, but I know the right person to ask, and I could bring it forward at our next meeting if that's possible. I mean, the more voices we have behind it, the better, always. Okay. Um, any any department or, or office in that you want with HUD or just anybody at HUD that has some leeway? What would you oh, thoughts on that? I, I have no idea. I'd have to look up and see who sets fair market rent. Um, okay. But I think anybody who like has employees under them, you know, that that might be helpful. Okay. I don't know. Someone with a manager or director in their title, like that sounds good. Okay, cool. <laughs> I want to thank you um, for presenting. Um, thank you for the work that you do, as well as Jen and as well as Erica. It's very much, and I do appreciate your passion for the work that you do. Um, I took a lot of notes based on everything you said. I think what I found, um, or like one of the most fascinating things I found, was the uh, the defensive if infancy. Act that yeah, you were talking about, defense. like I can have a child at the age of 17, I personally can't get the regular medical help that I might need, but I have um, a responsibility, I have, I have the control to do that for my infant child, that just blows my mind, that I, I can't do it for myself, but I can do it for an infant, um, so yeah, I found that absolutely fascinating and disheartening. Um, I know that we, through planning, I think we had uh, talked about um, a, uh, a home for uh, homeless youth that they were trying to start um, or trying to get going near downtown. And um, that's just one of those, uh, one of those communities that you don't really think about. It never comes to mind when you think about homelessness, you're either thinking about one person or you're thinking about a an adult with dependence. You don't necessarily think about, well, you could have children, you know, 13 to 17 who have, who are homeless for one reason or another. And that's definitely a group that you see underrepresented there when you're talking about homelessness. So, um, you know, definitely one of those, you know, another thing that just, just needs to come to light more and be, you know, have a spotlight shown upon it. So, but thank you all of you for, for the work that you do. Um, yeah, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, and just uh, real quick, <laughs> um, I do have, uh, UWGB is amazing. I do have two social justice interns who are currently working on creating like a legislative one pager um, that uh, <laughs> Commissioner Sheldon's wife has very kindly agreed to meet with them um, to see what they can do and what who they can present to about getting uh, medical and mental health care access to 17 year olds who are homeless. So. I have a question that I think will apply to all of the speakers. So uh, as you're speaking later, maybe you can, you can touch on it later. 
Um, but but Beth, one of the things that that you lifted up that that uh, I'm still sort of working through is this notion of seeing younger families that are bigger and what that will mean for the years to come. Typically, for the the families, the people who you work with, what are some key triggers or tipping points that are commonly experienced that push people into the position of being homeless? Are there through lines that you're seeing? Um, so I think, um, yeah, certainly there are some. A lot of it, and primarily, I would think it's sort of like a breakdown of the family or break the, the community um, lacking a safety net. Um, you know, there's some stuff that we know statistically that has been around for years. Uh, anyone who is a teenager, when teenagers have children, they're exponentially more likely to have a second child within 18 to 24 months. Um, and then again, have more and more children. And then we also have these weird policy things in the state of Wisconsin that um, you can't get your tubes tied in the state of Wisconsin unless you're married and your husband approves. Um, if you are under the age of 30, uh, you can't get your tubes tied without, you know, going a special way, or if you've had less than four children, less than four children. So I've had lots of clients who have attempted to having children, but the state of Wisconsin has absolutely gotten in their way. Yeah, it's crazy. You also can't get divorced if you're pregnant. And like, there's all kinds of things. <laughs> you're learning all the things. Um, and like, these are just, uh, like small thing, they're not small, they're big things, but these are just like, you know, these sort of things that we like run up against pretty frequently. Um, you know, we also see things like a lot of programming for youth. When you get pregnant, you're not really welcome in that programming anymore because they think you're going to be a bad influence. And so you've lost a whole community of people who were people that you could rely on or reach out to if you were in crisis. So that's another thing that we see a lot of. Um, one other thing I would say is probably mental health. Um, a lot of young people don't understand the ramifications because they're young. So like they don't have executive function, their brains aren't all the way developed. Um, so we see a lot of young parents who if they get pregnant, they stop taking any medication that they're on, which only exacerbates their mental illness and then also can then create schisms between them and their parents or them and their friends who are providing shelter. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a lot to think about, I know, it's very heavy. <laughs> Beth, I just want to say thank you um, for tying all of the data from the national data um, in with the local data here. I think that's really important to see where we stand. And I um, oftentimes, I, I, you know, I said this to you earlier, oftentimes our work, it, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, but we're kind of siloed. Um, and so it's important for us to take a step back and see how we can connect and how, you know, the data, how it kind of, um, how we all connect to that data point. Um, so I love how you, you know, in our earlier conversation, you brought up about, you know, the Green Bay um, School District, they have some data and statistics on their website. And then you talked about some other state websites. And so I think um, it's really important for us to also pay attention and be aware what's happening out there and how are they resolving things? And then how can we do that here? I'm, I'm just curious. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you. I mean, this has been enlightened and uh, you have put on the table uh, uh, a bunch of different um, issues, but do we have a total number and is the population of homeless people in Green Bay uh, you know, because I mean, you gave us uh, a star, a commissioner, uh, Tara was saying uh, statistics about the schools and the, you know, in different uh, areas. But I mean, is, is there a compile number? Do we, do we have those figures somehow? Um, yeah, I think Erica might know them better than me because <laughs> she's in charge of what's called our point in time count. So twice a year in July and January. 
um, homeless service providers and uh, volunteers um, travel around all of Brown County to count any um, any unhoused homeless individuals. So it starts at like 1145 and goes until about 5 a.m. Um, if anyone would be interested in volunteering to do that this July, it's the last Wednesday, fourth Wednesday of July into, so it's like that Thursday morning. Um, it's really enlightening. <laughs> uh, and then you get to take like the day off, right? Because if you're working until 5 a.m. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, I think everyone, especially in leadership positions in our community should um, at least at one time be a part of, um, number one, because we need the help, but also because it is really um, enlightening to see like where people are uh, when they're unhoused. Um, I believe that we do have numbers of like total individuals served as well. Um, the main concern with like the point in time count is it's just one day. Um, so if someone has found a hotel room or like isn't um, in the midst of a homeless episode, during that day, they don't get counted. Um, so I think it's right around what our community is like 2000 people a year, just about who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I could uh, gather some data for you guys uh, from our uh, statewide balance of state. They've done um, some uh, informational uh, programming for us where they'll show like how many people came to Brown County and how many people left. And it's usually pretty much a wash. So the number of people that we get coming to Brown County to access resources is actually less than the number of people we have leaving Brown County to access resources other places. Yeah, it's right around 2000 people a year, I think. To those numbers, more than individuals, uh, do you have a breakdown into families, for instance? Um, you know, like, uh, because for housing, you know, if you have one single individual might need a rental, but if you have a family, that's a family that needs, or, you know, like uh, yeah. in terms of assessing the, the need of, of a space and, uh, you know, if, if those numbers can be bre breaking down into you know, the particular situation. Yeah, um, not to keep bringing Erica up, but she also holds our coordinated entry list. Um, so we have one list in the community of uh, households, so that's individuals and families um, who um, have agreed to participate because it's a, it's a choice, but um, to get on a waiting list to be pulled into housing programs like House of Hope's Rapid Rehousing Program or New Cap's Rapid Rehousing Program. Um, and I think the last time I looked at the list, it's something like, you know, a hundred households with children and like 200 individual households. It's right around there. Those are not the exact numbers, but um, it's usually about twice as many individuals in their own households as there are families with households. But in those families is probably three to four times the amount of people as there are individuals. I'm making Erica look things up right now. I can tell. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> Sorry. I don't have a I don't have a license for our uh, homeless management information system. So I can't actually look at anything. So I have to like email other people to ask for those numbers. That's a very great strategy you have there, Mr. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna provide the data that Beth keeps referencing so that I don't forget it. Um so she um, I just looked at some of the data um, yesterday. So on our coordinated entry priority list, we currently have, for our households with children, we currently have 123 households identified. Um, and I want to put the asterisk on this, that this does not include everybody, right? There are households that have not reached out for help. Um, and we're constantly, as a community, looking at how we can um, capture that number too, uh, but 123 households with children. Um, and it looks like 256 households without children. So um, those are single um, adults. Um, our community also has what we call a shelter turnaway list. Um, so these are households that can't get into shelter uh, uh, for one reason or another in our community. We currently, um, 
have 23 households on that list, um, which makes up 84 people. Um, so I wanted to share that as well. Um, the other number that Beth was referencing was the January point in time count. Um, and so I just pulled that number too. Um, so on January 26th of 2022, um, there were 28 people that were found sleeping outside that night um, that uh, were unable to get into shelter for whatever reason, um, what, whatever it might be. So 28 households, um, that is a substantially higher number than we've experienced for a January point in time count than years past. Um, I was just trying to look up um, some of the statistics on that from previous years. So um, to compare that, um, in January of 2021, um, we had 16 people that were found. Um, so this year, January of 2022, we found 28 how, um, that is a high number, um, and I'll talk more about some of that stuff later, um, but I just wanted to touch on that data that Beth was referencing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Erica. Um, and these are all data points that um, if you guys have more specific questions and if you can get them to Tara, um, Erica and Jen and I can, um, you know, get you specific numbers and information. Beth, your latest comments brought up a terminology question that I have that I think we'll wrestle with as a, as a commission to make sure that we're, we're, we're speaking appropriately. Talk us, talk us through your point of view on homeless versus unhoused. Is there a, a meaningful difference that we should be navigating? Um, so it, um, it would probably um, encourage uh, experiencing homelessness not calling someone homeless because it is uh, just a short time in their lives. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing more and more now is that um, not everyone identifies with homelessness. Um, I can speak for like the youth who are in shelter right now. They don't think they're homeless. Um, they're just in shelter. Um, so it's really more of a, uh, um, you know, they, they don't have houses, <laughs> right? Um, I think when we talk about homelessness, it um, does have sort of like a really negative and um, almost derogatory kind of connotation to it. Uh, like it's a bad thing. Um, so some of the, some of the sort of like higher <laughs> ups have started to um, move more towards unhoused. Um, but I also think that like, as long as we're making sure that we're not labeling anyone as a thing and that they are just experiencing that for a short time, um, you could really go either way. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Beth. Um, it is 7 p.m. right now. Um, any last questions for her? Otherwise, feel free to email them to me and I will get you, um, I will put you in touch with Beth. Our next speaker we have here um, is Jen Schmo from Freedom House. Um, Jen, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, talk a little bit about housing, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. And I just want to say I'm so honored to have the privilege to speak to you tonight. And I appreciated how each of you opened session today with providing context and background for your life experience and your professional perspective. And I'd like to do the same for you so that you understand uh, where it is that I'm coming from as well. Um, I've lived in this community of Green Bay since 1987. Um, I had started in education and found my way by accident into human services uh, at the job center and in about 2008 and have spent a lot of time looking at the challenges of people groups from um, workforce lens, housing lens, a single mom lens um, in the roles that I've held, uh, you know, transferring from being part of the local coalition to also being part of a statewide coalition, housing coalition, 
So I've had a lot of experiences, um, both formally and informally. And what I loved about Tara, how you arranged tonight's program is that you put the statistical genius at the beginning. I am not the statistical genius. I am the story girl. I have spent the last five years prior to coming to Freedom House um, inside of Green Bay Community Church, launching and developing a program that addresses helping low wealth income households navigate their way out of poverty. I would love to say that we've had ginormous success, but unfortunately that isn't really the story. But there are many small stories and small successes within each that make that program and those efforts a success. Those households that we worked with who are also some of the same population, some of them had been at Freedom House, had been at House of Hope, had been at Golden House, some of our different shelters here in Green Bay. And what we experienced working with them is trying to help navigate the barriers that they were facing that come across a broad category, broad range of categories, such as issues with transportation, issues with housing, challenges in navigating enough income um, so that they can successfully navigate off of benefits and be able to truly become self-sufficient. I think if one thing I'd encourage you to look at is what really is the definition of self-sufficient? Are we okay with self-sufficient definition being just moving people from one state of homelessness and dependency to another, simply putting them onto housing vouchers, stacking up the benefits for them to navigate the eligibility, the burden of proof that they're poor and need help? Is that enough for our community? Is that what we want for our community? Do we want to encourage this continuation of dependence on assistance? Or do we want to rally as a kind of really come around folks and really help them uh, be encouraged and equipped to move beyond this sense of dependency? The CIRCLES program that we uh, developed in, uh, about five years ago gave us an incubator, if you will, of sorts to see what does it take to move people from a level of dependency to a level of independency, free of those um, assistance programs. And from the research, uh, I call it research because that's what it was, day in, day out, learning what's the next thing that's gonna keep somebody from meeting uh, the other side of their dream. Oftentimes it was systemic barriers, things like burden of proof of having to, maybe they don't have a social security card. In order to get one, they literally have to mail away their driver's license, their one key identification piece of identification, mail it away in this time of COVID so that they can receive a social security card. This kind of lockdown um, on services to our um, constituents is, should be a crime, to be honest. No one should have to go without their driver's license just to obtain their social security so that they can then be eligible for benefits, so that they can feed their families, so that they can obtain housing. Um, that one is like probably my equivalent of passion making me mad, like Beth's, uh, you know, what she shared with us about the, the young, young mommy, um, which I wanna just say, I did not know that Beth. Thank you for sharing that one. So it's these systemic barriers that we see time and time again, that really keep us from being able to adequately move folks out of shelters. And that is what I'm seeing now as the executive director of Freedom House is, our mission of trying to bring people to self-sufficiency is becoming more and more difficult. You heard Beth talk about the lack of housing stock. That definitely is going to probably end up increasing the time in which we have to keep families in shelter. In 2021, we only served 99 families. That was a 25% drop over the year prior. Again, probably related to COVID, related to housing stock and not being able to move families out of shelter. We see our racial demographics very similar to what 
House of Hope is citing, we served 18% of those 99 families were Hispanic and Latino, 31% were white, 32% African American, 2% Native, and 14% of a mixed race. We have to start asking ourselves, is the way that we've always done things the way that we have to keep doing them? And how can we get together collaboratively and creatively to look at different ways um, to make help our folks get past some of these barriers? Again, Beth mentioned the housing voucher situation. We know that there's not enough landlords, and we also know that we'll take the housing vouchers but we also know that we have firsthand experiences of people citing um, feelings that they are not getting served due to either their household composition, whether that pertains to that they have children or the composition is of a racial nature, maybe they're African-American, they felt like they did not get served, didn't get the apartment, didn't feel uh, um, comfortable in the showing didn't experience um, you know, that, that rapid attachment to housing. We also know another barrier is transportation. Between transportation and childcare, those are probably the two biggest barriers facing our families in being able to obtain income and then also being able to obtain housing. You don't have income, you don't have housing, you don't have transportation, you're gonna have a more difficult time getting to income. I apologize if it sounds like I'm stating the obvious, but it is also very frustrating that it is obvious and yet there are not enough solutions for these. Childcare is one that we're currently wrestling with. We're trying to decide should we even maybe hire a childcare specialist to be in-house just so our moms can get out to search for jobs to conduct interviews, to be able to access resources, to be able to dream bigger for their families. As you can see, this problem is very complex. I often like to call it a ball of yarn. There is no beginning and there is no end and there is no right place to start. You just have to start. In our work with circles, we've noticed um, the biggest barrier for folks getting out of poverty is actually trying to get off of the benefits. I'm not sure if this group is aware of the benefits cliff. I've spent the last five years trying to sit with moms, trying to figure out how can they taste or access a new job with a higher wage and yet still be able to have their child in daycare to be able to afford that daycare assistance. In the last year in my position with Circles Green Bay, we worked with the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank to develop a tool called the Cliff Dashboard and Career Planning Tool. And what that does is it really helps the individual look at what over their lifetime will be their income if they were to stay on benefits at the level of employment they're at versus what could they obtain if they were to engage in some education or in a career development track, perhaps with an employer who offers incentives to continue training and to be able to um, expand the amount of income coming into their household. We need to make sure that we're supporting programs to be flexible and responsible and personal to the person's needs that our delivery isn't full of rules, that our delivery has flexibility, that our, that our frontline staff are educated in how to meet the client where they're at and to help them identify how to work through the barriers that they're facing. I'd like to echo Beth's statement about access to mental health. That is probably our number two barrier to accessing things such as um, employment, to even being able to get this, the kiddos to school, to understand what are all the resources that their children may be eligible for or need. I'd like to pivot into what my dream for the city would be. I have a lot of dreams, a lot of, and my list is long and I don't think we have that much time. I like to see our city embrace the diversity. I think it's beautiful and I think it gets missed out 
And as a white woman, it makes me sad that so many of my peers don't see everyone as a contributing member with potential for our community. I'd love to see us implement a good landlord program. Can we encourage landlords, whether it's monetary incentive or it's recognition, but it's gotta be something to motivate them to understand and to see the restoration that can happen in folks when they're finally stable and able to think function for themselves and to dream for their families. We need more three, four, five bedroom rentals, homes that are affordable. We need safe neighborhoods. Many of our moms and dads are leaving their kids at home overnight, during the day. We need programming. We need help in those neighborhoods to help stabilize um, these households and to love on them, to help them for the future of our community. I think that's the end of my list for tonight. And I'm ready for some questions. Jen, thank you so much. And you know, you got me teary eyed there for a second there too, because you know, I can tell you're so passionate about your work um, by your emotions and just the way you're you talk about it. Um, I guess my first question for you, Jen, would be if um, if you did have a chance to, to change a policy or create a policy, what would it be um, in regards to housing? Um, you know, I think really it comes, it really comes down to the housing stock, those three and four bedroom, five bedrooms, you know, if we could get some of those built. And um, also the, I, I'd like to see more work uh, again with HUD um with regards to the benefits clip so if i can give you an example of what i'm talking about um there was a woman named amber that i worked with in the circles program who upon getting a new uh job getting a raise um she was in about a two-week time period seeing her responsibility of the housing voucher that means the amount she's paying uh, you know, essentially doubling in size. So it's going from like $225 a month all the way up to 600. So, which is fine if, you know, the, the pay period, if she had gotten the money in the time frame that also magically aligns to when the rent was due. And it would be fine if her childcare assistance also did not double. So what happens is folks are seeing their portion, their copay, just to make it easy, their copay for housing, their copay for childcare are all increasing at the same time when they raise their income. And so it creates this financial pitfall that none of us would ever put our families in, a position we'd never put our families in. So what it really does, and this was dr driven home to me when I was doing an interview two weeks ago here at Freedom House, I interviewed a young lady who said, well, I don't want too many hours because then I'll have to pay more for my housing. So if you could just employ me at 20 hours, I can still keep my housing and, and not have to worry about losing my voucher. That is a crime. We are basically incentivizing people to not work to their fullest potential, to be their fullest person. Um, so really, honestly, that is the one thing. Unfortunately, I know it's the one thing you as a city government do not have control over. But if there's anything to be leveraged, discussed, or um, advocated for, um, I think also it's just education. They don't know that this is what's going to happen. They're being set up for failure. They're being lured in. Here, we'll just put you on the voucher. 
And then eventually down the road, it becomes something that comes behind and kind of kicks them in the behind. Does that answer your question, Ms. Kane? Yes, it did and so much more. So thank you. You're welcome. Jen, I, I want to also thank you for, for being here uh, tonight. This, is, this has been really, really illuminating. Um, I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question about um, landlords. And, you know, so, so there was this uh, report that came out from the city in, of Green Bay in 2019 about barriers to fair housing choice. And one of the things that that report pointed out is that, you know, you have a lot of scenarios where you know, landlords, you know, don't want to accept Section 8 vouchers or they, they you know, to, to go back to something Beth talked about, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, somebody's got an eviction and so a landlord simply won't rent to them, you know, and, and there is a mechanism for people to complain about that. But the most recent number I saw was like in 2019, there were only like 13 complaints in our region, you mm -hmm. know, so there, there has to be, you um, way more instances than 13 of mm -hmm. people being discriminated against mm -hmm. uh, in housing. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, do any of your, um, you know, do any of the clients that you work with when they encounter this, I mean, do they, do they ever try to complain? I'm not saying they should, I, I can understand the impediments why, but mm -hmm. you know, do they ever try to complain about it? Would, would it be helpful to have some way to, you know, have the city of Green Bay encourage you know, more sort of whistleblowing to those kinds of things, because the opposite of the, I mean, I really like the way you framed this sort of good landlord program. I mean, one way to think about that could be like, how do we disincentivize, how do we incentivize good behavior, but also like disincentivize bad behavior for landlords? Right. You know, yeah. you, you get what I'm asking? I, I certainly do. And I, I bet you Beth has a comment about fair housing too, which I'd love to let you in on. But um, I think that, we have to also keep in mind that some, sometimes, not always, sometimes people don't even understand their rights. They don't even know that these fair housing complaint systems even exist. And so I think there is an, maybe that is an action item or an onus that the city or we as a community could take on is to up the marketing of that or the advertising or infiltrate the community with education. Um, I, that would be my first probably reasoning or rationale for why the low number. Um, it comes down to, especially with what we know about individuals who are perhaps raised in poverty. The young lady I was sitting with who told me she didn't want to make more than 20 hours to keep her housing. She wasn't, but she just got out of high school. She was 19 years old. That tells me that that is generational. She was raised to understand you go to school, you get on a housing voucher, you move out on your own. So it's also helping just change the story, the rhetoric and be educated about what is possible. I did think of something when you were talking, um, you know, I think one of the barriers for people getting into uh, using vouchers or for landlords from the landlord perspective of why maybe they don't wanna use vouchers is the inspection process could use some improvements. Hmm. The improvement, now I wanna say this with, I want you to know that I know someone very in that department. And if he was standing here, he would agree with me that it is very difficult sometimes to get those scheduled, to make it happen on time, uh, for people to not miss their appointments, um, difficulty for the landlords to follow up with the repairs, the standards for HUD inspection, which you have no control over, are quite steep. Uh, um, but I care in terms of making sure that people are living um, in a habitable environment. So I would say that would be another uh, place for improvement is how to better coordinate the inspection process so that the apartment passes the, the voucher HUD uh, guidelines. Uh, could be a place where perhaps city of God, city of Green Bay could lean in a little differently. Could I ask a quick follow-up? I mean, who, and forgive my ignorance, but I just don't know how this works. Who does that inspection? Do you know? 
the city of Green Bay has their own housing inspector teams, don't they? And then they're contracted? No, nope. nope. HQS inspections are done by any funded agencies. So ICS, who does the, um, uh, the housing choice voucher, they employ HQS inspectors. Um, House of Hope, we have a couple of programs that require an H, it's a housing quality survey mm -hmm. is what HQS stands for. Um, we have a, um, we have at least one staff who's certified to do HQS inspections. Um, and then in other counties, like for our TBRA program, um, because the city of Green Bay is an entitlement community. So any programs that get home HUD funds can't um, house anyone within the city of Green Bay. Um, so we have other counties <laughs> and so does uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So in our other counties, we, um, if we don't have our staff member who's qualified go there, we'll um, contract with other uh, like housing authorities to pay mm -hmm. them to do the HQS inspection. Anything uh, about fair housing, Beth? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I think my big issue with fair housing is that uh, they don't have anyone who actually answers the phone. It's a lot of phone tag when you're trying to make a report. The only report you can make is to a voicemail and they don't do a really good job of um, necessarily like closing feedback loops when people leave messages. So a lot of people just feel like they were wasting their time. And what's the point? Nobody's really going to help me anyway. Right. And I believe we don't have an office in Green Bay. It's the Appleton one that serves us. Mm -hmm. And then didn't we just talk about they're under some sort of um, renegotiation of contract and might be moving to Milwaukee or something like that? I thought we were talking I, about I, I'm not sure. Um, I've, I've heard that somewhere. I don't know. It's not, so that is also another reason why there probably wasn't a lot of complaints is that the responsiveness and um, the location. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. I, I have to be honest, I you know, I've, I've read like three or four of these reports that have come out in the past couple of years, and I was a little surprised that, that none of them really called for a more robust, you know, advocacy for people who might be experiencing this kind of discrimination. And I, and I feel like that's like low hanging fruit. If somebody has to mm -hmm. call some number in Appleton to leave a voicemail, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's something yeah. that as a city, we should be able to change. We should, we should mm -hmm. have, you know, somebody in this, in the city who's capable of essentially serving as maybe like a, you know, like a, um, what's the word? Uh, I guess advocate's not really the right word, but like an alms om, buds person or something like that. Mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to help, so, so that when when yeah. one of, so that one of when one of you is dealing with a situation where you have somebody complain to you, you can say, call this person. They'll actually kind of help to you know help help you to kind of navigate the system so that yeah. you can ensure that you're being treated fairly. Um, to me, that's. I'm, I'm editorializing a bit here, but it, it seems yeah. clear to me already that that's something that we should be able to change. I, I did have one other wish on my wish list that I forgot to say if I could just, I'd really love to see a self-sufficiency center for families. I mean, if we really want to talk about growing Green Bay, I'm sorry for all the single Pringles that have decided to remain that way. Um, our families are our future. Of course, deepening the skill set of our singles as well. But if we're going to really continue to be able to thrive, I think we need to have that focus on families. And then the other thing, uh, Michael, I wanted to address your question earlier about the tipping points to making people homeless. I can speak from my five years of experience with circles and then also what I've seen in the short time I've been here at this shelter. It does seem to always come down to two things, relationships and sometimes, and then also incarceration. Those are the two biggest patterns I've witnessed. So we have women who are left behind without resources by men who are incarcerated. And then also the, dis, you know, the, discrimi the discrimination, no, the disintegrate, the disintegration, sorry, the disintegration of relationships. And you can extrapolate that out to whether it's a, a DV relationship or it's a healthy relationship that just went separate ways or someone died and then they're displaced or that always seems to come back to that vein of relationship. I always said if I was going to go back and design high school and teach relationship and finances. 
And those two things, if you can lick those, you'll probably stay out of our programs. Anything else? Jen, do you have any examples of self-sufficiency centers that you've seen in other cities, other areas? Um, I, I, I do not. I probably should research. That was a great, that's a great idea. It's just more of, I, I, you know, and I think I have to give credit. It's not my idea. We've talked about this in the Housing Coalition, the struggles of um, and we've made a lot of improvements, but the struggle being people knowing what the services are, right? So we're not all co-located co in one area. You know, it's, we're all over the city. People uh, pre-COVID were bouncing around, being referred to here, to here, to here. Um, in the last eight years, I would say it is about, we um, took on a model of no wrong door, where as someone presents, if we can't serve them with the services that our agency offers, we're screening and referring into other agencies for other services. So that pivot in, in a, a, that pivot in service model within the subsector of housing has worked well, but as we all know, uh, if we're going to look at a more holistic approach of trying to help the family really achieve self-sufficiency, there are other things besides housing that have to be addressed, such as your medical, the mental health, the transportation, addiction support, employment services, um, food services. So how could we create a better network of, um, of accessing those services for our families? Um, I think the organization that's in the Valley that has all of the organizations under one roof does a really nice job of being able to do a more coordinated effort at serving their families. And hopefully by the end of this call, I will think of the name unless one of my awesome colleagues knows what I'm talking about. Beth, do you remember? No, Levin. Levin, that's it. Oh, in Appleton? Yeah, Levin and Appleton um, has managed to put a lot of organizations in one roof and, and runs it volunteer based primarily um, to meet the needs of those who are in crisis. Jen, I don't know if I missed it, but as you were listing out the percentage of families that um, you helped, the 99 um, families there, yeah. I, I didn't note um, if you no, uh, mentioned any Asian claims. Nope, it is it, not listed. There, I, do, I don't have a statistic for Asian. Is that, um, is that something that you've seen over the past couple of years that the Asian community just isn't as active or, I mean, the Asian community doesn't reach out for help? Yeah, that would be my, um, so when I was at the job center, I, a, I was the, oversaw the W2 program. I had two gentlemen who worked for me who are Hmong from this community. And we would often say to them, like, how, how come there aren't more Hmong? Then I'm not saying they're the experts, but they always said it's because the community really takes care of one another. Um, and, and reaches out and sometimes cares for, but we also do know there is a lot of isolation sometimes within the people group as well as they're transient and moving from one community to another. So um, I would say they are, have always been since I've been in this sector since 2008, the lowest uh, statistic captured for services. Just my experience. No, oh, that's very great to know. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Jen tonight? If not, again, please email me any questions you have and then I will um, send it to Jen and make sure that you guys um, get in touch. Well, thank you again. I just want to say I'm really a privilege to um, be here.
Thank you, Thank you Jen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, our next speaker is um, Erica. And I'm so sorry. Um, I, I just know already that I'm going to butcher, butcher your last name. So we all do. <laughs> um, so she's from NewCap. Um, so uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, so my name is Erica Villacrez. Um, so I am our housing director at NewCap. Um, I, Cheryl was going to present, but she's doing a leadership um, seminar this week. So I'm stepping in last minute for her. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working in the Brown County area in the um, housing world for the past six years. Um, I will own that I grew up privileged, um, white middle class my entire life. Um, and as Beth said, you know, we're, it, it's a trend um, amongst our um, peers in this uh, field. Um, and we're aware of it and constantly trying to um, uh, expand our diversity within our um, agencies. Um, I do also agree with Jen in that um, I enjoy the way that these presentations were set up. Tara obviously doesn't know that, but um, Beth is very data driven. Jen is story driven. And I love talking about evidence based practices and philosophies um, behind the work that we're doing. And so um, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, but first, to kind of talk about NewCap, um, our mission for over 50 years has been to move people from poverty to opportunities and economic security while enhancing community development with the vision um, of a world of hope, inclusion, and social justice where poverty has been overcome, people are met where they dream, and all live with dignity and security. NewCap has over 30 different programs. Um, that range from crisis services to community improvement. And we do cover a 10 county area in Northeast Wisconsin. In 2021, um, agency wide, we served 8,790 households, which consisted of 18,258 people. When I compared that to the number of folks we served in Brown County, 53% of the people we served overall were in Brown County. Um, so that's pretty substantial considering that's one of our 10 counties. Um, I looked at the demographics um, agency wide and Brown County uh, for us. 43% um, of those we served identify as male, 55% as female, and then 2% either did not report their gender or declined to answer. We just talked about race a little bit um, with Beth and Jen. Um, and so our trends match what they were talking about. I did, you know, I was looking up um, the Asian statistics um, after Tara just asked about that. Um, our, we only show in 2021 that we served 1% one per, uh, 1 of the folks we served were Asian. So um, it is it's a very, but overall our trends match Beth and Jen um, when it comes to race. Um, in Brown County, um, our, we have a variety of different housing programs. Um, they range from short-term housing options, such as rapid rehousing, along with long-term permanent supportive housing. We have a street outreach program. We're currently operating an eight-family shelter. We are also in the process of opening um, a shelter care facility, similar to House of Hope, uh, for unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, we also administer the Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance Program uh, for Brown County. Um, and so we pride ourselves in that each of our programs are low barrier, um, regardless of what program it is. Um, and we offer the wraparound services and case management. Um, to kind of get into some of those um, evidence-based practices and philosophies that we utilize and um, are often uh, used throughout our community. Um, Beth and Jen are very familiar with them as well because they use them too. Um, we utilize housing first um, and the belief that housing is a basic human right that everybody should have access to. When you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, it's it's that pyramid, right? Where it kind of shows the bottom tier is your most basic need. And in order to meet those most complex needs, 
students that are higher up on that pyramid, you have to meet the bottom tiers first. And so housing and shelter fall right into that bottom tier alongside air, water, food, and so on. We have to meet that housing or shelter option before somebody can focus on anything else, um, such as increasing income, improving their health, and building social capital. How can we as a community expect somebody to focus on various aspects of their lives when they are spending their days asking themselves, where am I going to sleep tonight? How am I going to get to shelter? Will my kids be able to get to school tomorrow? Will I be able to eat tonight? And when will I be able to shower next? Therefore, um, many of our agencies in our community um, and NUCAP, we utilize that housing first model, um, meaning that people don't have to be housing ready to receive housing. Um, we try to provide access to permanent housing as quickly as possible without prerequisites. Um, and regardless of what's on their background with the understanding that those wraparound services will come second to housing. Um, at NewCap, on any given day, we experience approximately 50 people that walk into our lobby um, of our Green Bay office, along with over 150 phone calls to our 800 number. These are all folks that are experiencing some sort of poverty or housing insecurity or homelessness. The vast majority of them, like I said, are seeking shelter services, rental assistance, mortgage assistance. Our staff provide triage services, identifying short-term and long-term needs and goals. Um, and so one of the big shifts um, throughout all providers um, is you'll see that people are starting to um, utilize holistic approaches. Um, and so NUCAP is using a whole family approach. Our goal is to um, not just meet people where they are, but where they dream. Um, and so we utilize that whole family approach supported by Housing First Mindset. We partner with uh, the households that we're serving to address their needs and make progress on their goals, no matter what is on their background or what their barriers might be. The partnership increases the likelihood of long-term success for everyone involved. And by using this model, household members work together to support each other's goals and achieve long-term change and stability. Um, it is strength-based um, and the households know best what they need for themselves. Uh, when looking at barriers in our community, um, I would agree with Beth um, that we've seen a shift um, from situational homelessness to more of a generational homelessness. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that. Um, one of the struggles, and both Beth and Jen um, spoke on it, is um, the housing stock. Um, and so right now it's a landlord market. Um, access to housing is, is in the hands of landlords and property management companies within our community. Um, rental unit costs are currently increasing faster than incomes are, especially for those on a fixed income. Um, I pulled some numbers based off of our Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and in 2021, the average monthly rent cost that we spent um, for units was $770 per month. Already in 2022, and we're still only two months into that, that average rent cost is already up to $837 per month. This is an 8.7% increase. While that seems like a small number, that is a substantial financial burden for our households we are serving. In comparison, the federal cost of living adjustment, so the COLA uh, that went into place on January 1st of 2022 for those on a fixed income was, ju was just a 5.9% increase. Um, so that's an example, you know, that cost of living, those rental costs are increasing more than um, the income is. Landlords are running a business um, and have increased expenses themselves, especially because of the pandemic. And our consumers um, and clients are now having to pay that price. Um, yes, there have been programs over the past couple of years that had fair market rent waivers, um, and that was great. But now the rental costs in our community are substantially higher than what we can pay, as Beth was touching on with that. Um, the downside to rental costs increasing, the costs are never gonna go back down. And so our staff um, are constantly spending time trying to negotiate with landlords, trying to figure out how we can get that rental cost down so that we can actually assist with one of our programs. Um, so we try things like having all utilities included or whatever it might be, um, just trying to eliminate more bills for the households. 
Additionally, over the past year, we've seen that landlords have grown more selective in who they uh, rent to. We have seen landlords decline to work with people getting assistance due to stereotypes around people being on government assistance. Three different case managers have reported in the past month that three different landlords have said those people are all the same. Um, so there's quite the stigma in our community at this point. In addition to increased rent costs, the low number of vacant units had, like I said, has led to that landlord's market. Um, so there's low supply and high demand. Um, so an example that one of our staff provided um, that she recently experienced was they were trying to house somebody in a $700 a month apartment. The applicant um, makes $2,100 a month, so approximately three times the rent. Um, let's see, they really had, they had some poor credit um, and criminal charges, past criminal charges um, in comparison to uh, you know, an applicant that might be 18 years old, no criminal background, no credit issues or whatever, but is making less rent. That 18 year old is probably not gonna get picked um, because it's based on its money. Money talks in this market. We're seeing landlords pick the person that's making more money um, because they're not, they don't wanna take a risk. I've had landlords tell me that they don't rent to young people. Um, even when we say, okay, but we're going to pay security deposit, we're going to pay first month's rent, application fees, whatever it might be, they think that our young folks are too high of a risk. Um, even with that clean background and rental subsidy, um, they won't do it. They won't take that risk. Another barrier that we've identified is transportation. Um, so this it may not seem like an obvious housing barrier, um, but if you don't have that consistent, reliable transit that is available when buses aren't. It severely limits your housing options and accessibility of employment that you may rely on uh, to pay your rental costs. Um, another barrier that we've seen, a trend that we've seen is an increase in property management companies. And so it's created a little bit of a housing monopoly in our community. If somebody is denied by one property management company, um, that just eliminated six, seven, eight properties that they could potentially live at. And so that's causing a substantial barrier. We have some big property management companies that are scooping up units um, right and left. And so it's really limiting where we can um, get folks housed. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Uh, NewCap is currently in the process of hiring housing navigators to assist with building and mending relationships with landlords, along with helping break down the stigma behind working with housing assistance programming. Our goal is to increase our landlord base, opening up that housing market for uh, Brown County uh, community members. Uh, for any of our folks that we're serving that are experiencing housing insecurities and homelessness um, while they're in school at NWTC, we also have a program called Safe to Study, um, which assists in obtaining and maintaining housing um, so that they can increase their education. Um, it's said that the higher your education is, the higher your income could be. And so we constantly want to encourage folks to continue to increase. Um, so we also have a variety of other programs here in Brown County. Um, we you know, just because somebody's in a program and maybe they graduate the program and they're on their own um, and they've graduated successfully, we still want to provide those continued services. Um, so we have family success coaches that they can work with. Um, we have programs such as our financial capabilities to continue working on financial management and budgeting, um, our low cost community health clinic um, and some various uh, like programs like our My Garage program for car repairs. So I just want to um, talk about that because I think it's really important that even once they graduate, they still need that community, um, those supports uh, wrapped around them. When asked um, for magic wand ideas, um, one that I would really was um, for homelessness and housing assistance to be protected under a protected class under fair housing. Um, Dane County and Milwaukee County and Cook County have all done this. Our community tried to do this. Um, the Joshua Housing Task Force uh, took this on like two, three years ago. Um, we went to the county board and it kind of 
ended there. Um, it, they essentially said it was a state problem. Um, and so we would really like that to happen. Um, but in order to make that happen, we need that community buy-in, visibility, and support on local county and state levels. Additionally, we would love to see some sort of public service campaign around homelessness and housing as a basic human right. We often hear the whole not in my backyard um, and landlords have said that to us. And so we want to try to break down that social stigma and those stereotypes around homelessness um, and the fact that people deserve housing regardless of their past or current situations. Um, so we want to disseminate messages to the public about that, about humanity and taking care of our neighbors. Uh, being homeless doesn't mean there isn't a home for you kind of thing. Um, Jen talked about landlord incentives, and that's a big passion of mine. And I was so excited that over the past couple of years, uh, two years during the pandemic, we had the ability to utilize some landlord incentives. Um, but that's, that's not an ongoing thing through our funding sources. And so um, that if you look nationally, there's various landlord incentive programs out there. Um, some communities have programs where it's uh, there's a pot of money and people can apply for assistance with paying for damages after somebody leaves, right? Um, one of the uh, stereotypes out there is folks on assistance are going to cause damage and then who's going to pay for it because they're they're um, living in poverty, they can't afford it. And so these communities have that pot of money that landlords can apply for a set amount of money to help pay for those damages. There's also incentive programs out there where people can... Um, Landlords can get like a stipend for the first however many um, vouchers they take or whatever it might be. And so just working with housing assistance programs, um, they might get like a $500 stipend per unit. Um, so there's a variety of different um, types of those uh, landlord incentive programs. But like Jen said, you know, it's the whole good landlord idea. So those are kind of my magic wand wish list things. I'm sure I have lots more, but that's kind of what I came up with. <laughs> that's all I have. Thank you, Erica. That was very eye-opening. And I, yeah, like you guys said, I didn't know that I stacked you guys at the, the right time slots. And yeah, that was great. Um, so I, um, I had a quick question. Um, in regards to um, in in regards to I guess you were you were talking about the levels of Pavlov um, tiers of needs, mm -hmm. um, and then you also stated that you guys meet people where they dream, right, and not just where they are at. at. So what does that kind of look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, people have those immediate crisis moments, and we want to try to secure that housing for them. But what we don't want to do is like squash any of their big goals or dreams just because you're experiencing homelessness in this moment or an episode of un being unsheltered doesn't mean that you can't own a house. You can't. Um, we always use the example of being, going on to being in the NBA or whatever it might be. We want people to map out those dreams. And so we want people to understand that they're not defined by this moment, right? So like, just because we might be at the park meeting with them because they're sleeping under, um, you know, the pavilion there doesn't mean that they don't have dreams or ambitions or whatever it might be. And so, you know, we kind of, not that we look past that homeless episode, but what we do is we're, you know, awesome. Let's try to figure out how to meet that short-term need, but let's focus on that long-term need as well. Let's get you um, set up. Let's work out what do you need to do to get there? Um, set, setting those smart attainable goals. Eric, uh, I want to oh, go sorry. ahead, please. No, go. Thanks. Um, for being here as well. Um, one thing that I guess didn't occur to me before is when you were talking about property management companies, I guess that was a, another um, problem that, that that didn't cross my mind. You think of rental, you're thinking just one landlord, you know, if you're rejected at this location, okay, well then maybe you're dealing with another landlord and another location with rental, with those property management companies, like you said, you could actually be eliminated, not just from one rental property, but from multiple rental properties. And I think that's just a, 
issue that we don't necessarily foresee happening when these rental management companies start popping up. So that's that one was eye-opening. I didn't realize that that was, that was the case. And it's kind of funny when you had mentioned um, having uh, three instances where a landlord said, you know, well, those people are all the same. When you're talking about landlord incentives and programs like a pot of money to help pay for damages, my immediately thought, my immediate thought is, how do we know that those renters caused those damages and that landlord isn't just taking advantage of, you know, of a program mm -hmm. that is, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, we're constantly telling folks uh, Folks that aren't on assistance cause damages too. Like we're all human. Yep. <laughs> um, and so I think that's a big piece. You know, it's it, it's that stereotype, that stigma. Then maybe they had one bad experience and now it's, you know, um, shaped their opinion for forever. Or maybe they heard about an experience or whatever it might be. And like I grew up, my parents always rented um, throughout my entire childhood. They They never owned. And my experience with the landlord is I could see that landlord saying, ooh, I have this pot of money that I can go to to pay for damages caused by the, um, by the renter when truly, you know, in order to fix them when he's not going to fix them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like, if we set that up, okay, what is the follow-up from the city's side to make sure that that landlord is actually doing what they're supposed to do with the money? Yeah, and I've actually read um, about various programs, and I don't remember which city it was in, but one of the cities um, for that pot of money, they have an inspector go in. There's a cap on the number, on the amount of money that you can get. Um, it was only a couple thousand dollars, um, but the inspector went in, um, they identified exactly what needed to be done and what that plan was to fix that. So um, there were some, you know, stipulations around utilizing it. Um, I'm not sure if they went back in afterwards to check, um, but I do think that would be a good idea or, you know, something of the sorts, but yeah. yeah. I have a question, Erica. Well, first of all, thank you again. And thank, thank you to all of you. I mean, this has been a really extraordinary presentation. Uh, you say during the, uh, your talk, I took notes very quickly that, uh, that you guys try to pass an ordinance to uh, consider homelessness a protected category. Did I get that right? And then you say that it went all the way to the county and it stopped there. Did I? I wrote that. When was that? Um, I would say, Will, you got something? I, I, in my, I think it was summer of 2020, maybe. I'm not I sure. Yeah. Say one to two years ago. It, it went two. through at the, it went through the city first. Okay. Uh, and, and so the city supported it, right? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, the, the, so I can, I have the link saved somewhere. I can share it with um, the group after I watched the entire meeting of the, the commission, um, but they it was going through at the same time as the, the equal rights ordinance. Oh. And um, so it was, I think the issue was that it was too much trying to get passed at once um, where it raised some flags. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the people that was present, I think um, was also a property owner and had some experiences to relate and just, you know, express the need to, I think we need to, to look at this separately. Um, not as part of the the equal rights ordinance um so it, it failed um it failed there um i don't know elder corpus dax if you were included in those if you were at those meetings at all um i was and this is ringing a bell and i don't recall if it failed or if it was just it was simply removed taken out for and then it was, it was one of those like we'll deal with this separately yeah. So it's not like I it's 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 there. I think there's opportunity for it to to come back. Okay. Again. So, so if you take it out with the uh, intent to 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 deal with it separately, it was never dealt with. Right. I mean, it's just still in limbo. OK, right. that's good to know. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ortiz. I was I was going to flag the same thing. I think certainly this is something for the commission to take some action on uh, as we continue in this process moving forward. You could ask a quick follow-up question. So that was homelessness. And did that also relate to Section 8 vouchers? 
Mm -hmm. Homelessness and housing assistance. So I've read some conflicting things. Um, so the so and maybe somebody knows the answer to this. I don't expect necessarily anybody to, but if somebody does, that would be helpful. So I've read that state law says that you're not allowed to discriminate based on the you know whether someone is using housing assistance to pay for rent, or is that discretion up to local units of government? I, does anybody know the answer to that? I my and I apologize if if um, I'm not understanding your question correctly, but my understanding is that the it's it's not considered you know voucher is not considered a source of income. I'm sorry. I just I mean I mean a a protected class under housing discrimination. Okay. That, that's all I mean. Um. So the Fair Housing Act only provides those protections for federally assisted housing programs. So like you are only protected when you are applying to a federally assisted housing project. Yep. Okay. So like okay. just a regular landlord they the fair housing act can only like only does federally assisted housing programs okay and so um other but but some um cities in wisconsin have applied it that way yes okay gotcha that's, that's yeah and i think they've done it more in like a you know you can't discriminate against someone for their race so you also can't discriminate for against someone for for their you know housing status gotcha thank you Your question reminded me of something that I don't think a lot of people know or understand that we have a lot of property management groups who um, might might say on the uptake, you know, that they might consider a voucher, but yet they have in place um, income requirements so that you have to make a certain percent, you know, like three times the amount of rent, right? And then at that level, you would not even be eligible for a housing voucher and so thereby we are actually kind of recreating some of the redlining and putting people only in certain segments of our city and obviously with them you know free will being independent proprietors I don't know that there's much the city can do or anyone can do but I just wanted to bring that to light in context of the conversation so that everyone understood that that is pretty rampant in our city and increasing as we see some of these larger um, management companies moving to town. Thanks everybody. I, I just wanted to, um, you know, just say thank you to Erica and, and everybody else. Um, I, I think something Erica said is really important, which is that, you know, housing should be considered a human right and, you know, my, my view on this has always been that if we, if we thought about that as our premise for thinking about the housing in this city, we would do things a lot differently because we haven't been prioritizing that idea, right? I mean, from what, if it kind of bring together what all three of you are, are saying, we have to figure out a way to make sure that there's housing available for everybody. And we're simply not doing that when you know, landlords are holding so many more of the cards and, and able to, to essentially, you know, without maybe, without maybe without legally doing it, but effectively discriminating against so many people in our community. That's got to change. So thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you, Erica, Beth, Jen, for presenting to us tonight. Um, truly such great information, eye-opening at times. Um, I, my takeaway is that we need to break up the system. The system needs to change, needs to end, because it's like it's you see it in just the simple fact I did. It's it's truly systemic. Thank you. I was going to say thank you for having us. I think um, the three of us, we all have our, you know, our, we like to soapbox about our different topics, you know, um, which sounds silly, but I mean, we all are very passionate about what we do. And so we're very excited to share that with you guys. And um, so I just want to thank you for inviting us. This is a good crowd for soapbox and we like the soapbox too.
No, and we want to and we want to hear more soapboxing. Who else <laughs> do you think we should be hearing from um, on this topic? Um, I would certainly, um, you know, have you uh, reach out to um, uh, Casa Alba. They um, have some significant concerns in the community. Um, the uh, I had. Um, told Commissioner Tara that um, in 2019, the uh, city put out their 2019 uh, impediments to fair housing report. And uh, one of the things that's really significant in that is that there's one census track where more than 40% of the residents are Hispanic. Um, and then like the rest of the city, you don't really see that. Um, and, you know, according to what most, uh, you know, like universities would say is that that's a segregated community. Um, so that's certainly something that we should be doing and reaching out to. Could the city be doing things like, um, I don't know, providing uh, uh, teletranslation services that all homeless service providers could use? Because that's a significant expense for all of us um, if we don't have interpreters on site. Um, so it's very difficult for a lot of, uh, you know, Hispanic or non-English speaking um, folks in the community to access services. Um, so like that's another thing that we could kind of push for. Um, and then I would also encourage like We All Rise, African American Resource Center. Um, we all work really closely with them. But you know, the size of those organizations limits their ability to really be in the community and doing kind of um, more. So um, certainly those. And I know someone said that they were uh, working with Comsa as well. And I believe that someone from Comsa is on this commission. So like, yay. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, um, reaching out there. And then I would also consider talking with the ADRC. Uh, Devin is fantastic. And um, Robin Kuklinski, who used to be incredibly involved with housing, is now very, um, you know, one of the folks who works at the ADRC. And um, she has a lot of knowledge and information around how individuals with disabilities experience homelessness. Those are excellent suggestions. Thank you. I think uh, one other person I thought of, um, Elizabeth Webb is very knowledgeable about how students in the Green Bay public school system experience homelessness and those families. Uh, she works very closely with them. She's the McKinney Vento Homeless Liaison uh, Super Duper Woman Director, I guess. I don't even know really what her title is, but she's uh, she's been around for a long time and uh, is like the pinpoint person for the Green Bay schools. Every school district also has their own McKinney Vento homeless liaison person. So uh, De Pierre, Schwaben, and all of the other school districts also have people um, identified in those roles as well. Um, so you might want to understand, you know, from them be able to then glean how homelessness impacts um, the trajectory of their educational attainment. Oh, uh, from an employer perspective, are you thinking about like, you know, housing from an employer perspective? Um, I would suggest, I know JBS has hit some really hard times of trying to house people, um, you know, their labor pool, they have a large labor pool, need housing, they're recruiting from distances away, moving people in, and um, I'd heard stories that they were actually putting people up in hotels to try and make it go, so I, I don't know, I, I think it would be interesting to entertain from an employer perspective the struggles that they're seeing with getting people housed and perhaps the Chamber of Commerce would have more information on that too. Thank you for all the suggestions. Um, I captured as much as I can, but I definitely will be reaching out um, back to some of you for um, some of the contacts there. 
Um, I really appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you guys. Thank you to the presenters for staying with us for this for the entire time. I mean, all the information you guys have um, shared with us is so important um, to know. And uh, I can say 60 to 70% of this information was new to me. Um, so I am very, very happy to hear that um, you, we have people on the grounds working on this on, in housing. Um, and so I wanted to kind of speak about the next steps that we will be taking as, um, the, as the Equal Rights Commission. So what we hope to do with these Equal Rights um, public hearings is to gather enough information and insight from experts such as yourselves and then um, also from the, the public stance and different perspectives um, we wanted to collect the insight and be able to put together um, a report of recommendations that we would bring back to um, the, the city and city council that we would present to them. And recommendations could be such as um, things that we were mentioned today, you know, that homelessness um, portion that Erica mentioned. Um, it could be um, something like how um, Commissioner Shelton was talking about um, creating some type of warm warm line that people can call into um, if they can't get the help that they need. Um, and so, yeah, that's where we want to move forward with. Um, and so we are going to be hosting two more um, sessions and we'll be inviting um, some more speakers and also the community to participate in these. But I will also make sure that um, all of you are informed when these are so you can also attend um, to, to hear what anyone else has to say, or you can also raise questions as well during the, the conversations. But um, Commissioner Shelton, did you have anything else to add to that before we um, adjourn the meeting? I don't. Thank you so much for leading all this. And, and thanks again to our guests. So this has been an incredible conversation, really. Thank you. All right. Well, um, if no one has any more comments or um, questions, I am going to ask for a motion to um, for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. To, okay. Uh, motion by Elder Corpus Stack, second by Commissioner Shelton. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night. I really appreciate you. all your time.